the international elite are buying up London property in numbers never seen before. You would never get this unless you were in the league of like a 50 million pound house. <gasps> this is amazing. With such demand, property developers are now selling fully furnished apartments for millionaires short on time. At some level, we are selling an entire lifestyle. I mean, the knives and forks are in the drawer. There's the right vintage champagne in the fridge. Thank you. But not every international client wants somebody else's interior vision. What if the woman in the family is a working girl? We don't actually do womanly houses at all. <laughs> I'm not sure if I want to use interior designer, honestly. Nobody better than me knows what I want. In the exclusive area of Chelsea, developers and new residents are finding their tastes at odds with the locals. This is going to be a stir in steel and timber. It's going to have leather treads. Really? Yeah. It, it's very, very expensive, but one has to ask, is it actually good taste? I wanted to see the fish tank from the toilet. The builders were horrified. <laughs> As new residents move in, Come on in, the old guard is quietly moving out. Rather difficult for artists to stump up for these sort of places nowadays. But that's happened all over Chelsea, I think, I fear, because it's become so expensive. As London's housing market continues to attract the international elite, property developers are flourishing. But whilst 10 years ago new homes were sold empty, interior designers are now muscling in. You can now buy an elite home with an elite lifestyle ready-made inside. What we're coming to see today is some apartments um, within the heart of Mayfair. For reasons of discretion, we're not going to reveal the address or film the outside of the building. OK, so we could stop filming now. Sally McCarrith's an architect who's been working with a developer on a three-bedroom flat now selling for £16 million. Pounds. This is the bit we can film. This is a piece I picked up from the 60s. It's an Italian piece. That came from Paris. There are some pieces in the apartment that are extremely valuable that are on loan from some of the galleries in the area. In this flat, Sally's pulled together millions of pounds of art and furniture, all of which can be bought with the apartment. It's a strategy known as turnkey development. It's really just a device to give people the opportunity to just write the cheque, walk in and, and get on with it. At this level of the market, it's a very international buyer. They probably have properties in all the cities you would expect. They come to London and they say, OK, I've got two days, I want to buy an apartment, show me what you've got. And what they don't want is to buy the same as everybody else. I don't know, they don't necessarily want these kind of incidental books. Sally speculates on who might buy the flat and creates a personality for them, told through the interior. We're responding to 20-year-olds, you see them driving around London up and down Park Lane in these kind of incredible car wrapped Lamborghinis. What they want is a level of credibility in their peer group. Books by the side of the bed, the general debris of life, stylish debris, but uh, it's, it feels real. To give any younger buyer a cultured look, Sally's even curated a 4,000-book library. It's now about just having the right smattering of French philosophy, a little bit of abstract art. Yes, it's contrived, but it's real and credible. It adds credibility, perhaps, for the purchaser. But Sally's work is a gamble. There's no guarantee that a new owner won't simply rip out everything she spent months putting in. If somebody didn't want this, would you have to crane it out again? Yes. We have to make a best guess. We don't know whether someone will want any of it, that's any of the furniture, any of the art. There's definitely an element of risk doing it like this, but if we're right, there are people who don't have the time but do possibly have the money to say, oh, I'll, I'll take the whole lot. After you. 
Each project's success depends on Sally correctly guessing any buyer's lifestyle. Get it right and they'll be falling over themselves to invest. Get it wrong and people won't look beyond the front room. In Chelsea, she's beginning another ambitious and speculative turnkey project. We know that Diana was painted in this building. We know that Margaret Thatcher was painted here. We know Oscar Wilde used to hang out here. We know the Prince of Wales came here. Prince of Wales from the 1870s, that is, not the current Prince of Wales. Sally is developing this recently vacated artist studio into a turnkey home that marries artistic history with the trappings of super luxury. Right there next to that beam, stick the walker in there, look. There's a kind of checklist, if you like, of things that people at this level of the market might be looking for. Gym, because I don't go to a public gym. It's what everyone calls the media room. It's a cinema room, really. Lots of comfortable furniture to sit on, some beautiful art. Laundries and wine cellars and ski storage. But what makes this apartment unique is the original double-height painting studio. This is the room that arguably sells the apartment. I mean, it's huge, absolutely huge. We're going for it a bit with this room because it feels like we kind of owe it to the building. This is the room we've got to get right, because we could get it so wrong. It could be an absolute disaster, I suppose. Like all Sally's turnkey projects, at this stage, she has no idea who might live here. We don't know who's going to buy this. They could be American, Middle Eastern, Russian. I have no clue. It's going to be someone, I suspect, a, a rather more flamboyant character who really sees themselves living this kind of life. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's surely not to everyone's taste, but uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll see who it appeals to. Turnkey development is sweeping across the capital as the time-poor super-rich jet in for their weekend property deals. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, guys, let's go. But not every client is in such a rush. Troy, she's way too small for you. She's way too small, OK? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Julia is a Russian expat with an estimated £20 million property empire and two dogs, Troy and Boris. Boris, no! It's a national landmark. Ew! Come on. London is a very, very old city. It has a soul, but it still kept a young personality. We have properties in Moscow. We had, until the recent time, properties in America, which were sold. We don't see the point of keeping it so far. And right now we're having one, two, three, four, five. Yes, four properties in London. But Julia's now on the hunt for a new London home and has decided to look around a four million pound turnkey development near Covent Garden. Julia. Yes. Hi, I'm Paul from Beachman Estates. Nice to meet you, Paul. Very nice to meet you. How are you? Very, very good. The whole look and feel is like, you know, Venetian palazzo or... So it's, it's got a that very theatric, Italian still and Still a little bit theatrical, yes. yes. Yeah, they kept yeah. the theme, definitely. And uh, the furniture, is it furnished okay, or not? OK, OK. As you see it, that's what you get. The interior design, the entire package is sold with the apartment. Like Sally, this developer has curated an interior to wow potential buyers. So this is the, uh, the main bedroom. Which is a different colour. Nice touch, beige. <laughs> beige. That's for the very particular taste, this one. Table. <laughs> Could be much, much better. Much better. It's eclectic. You have to be very talented to put eclectic pieces together. I agree. Because, again, it feels like it's was bought in Zara. This was. I hope not. Turnkey with Julia seems to be a risky business. If you are selling a flat almost four million, you have to put more thoughts in the decoration. You have to invest more. Even the wooden chairs, it has to be completely different upholstering. And it definitely won't be beige. For every client who buys in a hurry, perhaps there's also one who will pick everything apart. Look how much effort they put into this place. OK, for me, wrong effort. 
it's very seldom done right. And look how quickly it could go wrong. And it's so much remodeling involved in the future, again. There's a pub downstairs. <laughs> wow, that's a neighbor. For four million pounds, there's a neighbor for you on a Friday evening. So, no, I won't buy this particular one. London's place at the top of the international property market has sparked a flourish of building across the capital. Designers are now creating thousands of apartments offering ready-made London lifestyles. But it's not for everyone. <laughs> Come on in. Guys, stay behind. Come on in. After her visit to a turnkey development, Julia has bought a five-storey townhouse that's untouched and empty. That's what sold this house. I love the idea of the open space. The more open, the better. And from here, you can see a little garden. And I hope my four-legged family will be very happy there. And I think it's very, very English. You know, it's always my home, my castle. When you start a new house, you always have to think what you want from the house. And I know exactly what I want. It has a ceiling light. So if we will, I don't know, open and make all that light go down, and maybe we can put a very long chandelier, I think it could make a very interesting wow point. Having already paid £6 million for the house, Julia now wants to completely rebuild the inside. Oh, that's a kitchen. I want this house to suit only two of us and of occasional guests. So I want one room per floor. That's what I want. And one more thing, I want to dig and do the basement. Because look, where will you fit the gym, the sauna? With ideas buzzing, Julia's off to choose an interior designer. Bye, guys. <laughs> no, 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 you stay home. Not a decision she's taking lightly. It's a very important decision, because at the end of the day, you will be working with this person non-stop for another year and a half at least. And if I don't like the person, it means he won't like me or she won't like me, and that will be a disaster. Maybe with a stronger woman, I will reach my goal faster. The strong woman top of her list is currently on a recce at London's luxury trade fair. How are you? I love it. This is so cool. I love that. A millionaire bachelor, Rachel. How perfect for this for his roof terrace. Nicola Fontanella has a reputation as one of London's most innovative interior designers. This is good for the stage. Look at this, like it's like sack. How cool. No, but it's cool. It is sack. Part of the recce today is to see what's out there, what's coming up what we don't want to use. Because a lot of this is very commercial, so it's very high street. And we don't really do high street. Yeah. The only thing I hate about this is I can't bear the fixings. Why well, kind of look out, out of the box? Most people don't understand where I'm coming from straight away. And then it all comes together. Kind of like Elizabethan rock and roll. This trade show is showcasing the cutting edge of European interior design. Maybe it's just on the edge of being Essex. Yeah. <laughs> you have to have gold plating because caviar against silver ruins the taste. And these are vodka shots. I think it's really rude that there isn't any caviar or vodka in there at all. <laughs> this is a Verde Guatemala solid marble bathtub. The lump of marble that this was carved from started life at eight tonnes. The most expensive we done was from a solid piece of rock crystal. That uh, was £625,000. Girls, move, come on. No, <laughs> move, move. For Nicola, <laughs> it's not quite cutting edge enough. I know what you're thinking, Rachel, but I, to be honest with you, there's nothing here. Oh, I don't like this. I don't like any of this. This looks pretty awful. <laughs> there's some things that I really think are just not for us, but they'll do very well. That's the whole point. Um, but the show's not that inspiring. Honestly, the fashion show yesterday morning was far more inspiring. Oh, you should have come to that. <laughs> but now I'm starving. 
Nicola is meeting Julia for the first time. It could be the start of a long relationship. What we need to find out today is actually what she wants. Um, we need to know what her style is, we need to know her budget, we need to know time frame, and we need to know that we can work together, which is most important. Julia, good to meet you. Nice to meet you. Would you like to find me down? Thank you. She might not even like me. That's the other thing, you know, like a lot of clients, a lot of clients, you know, I'm a bit like Marmite. They know I'm going to make them a lot of money. They don't necessarily like me, but, you know, I'm somebody who gets the job done. At last, we finally meet. Have you had a tea and coffee? <laughs> yes, thank you. It's OK. Pleased to meet you. Very nice to meet you, Nicola. Nicola Fontanella, do you want to come through? Bibi, have you asked Julia if she'd like a drink? It will be coffee, will be nice, thank yes, you. Absolutely. On the low ground floor will be the living room, uh, the kitchen, and the dining room. Okay. And the kitchen does not have to be a very big one. No. Because I'm not a great cook. <laughs> no, okay. But fine. I like to entertain. His and her dressing room, is not that an His and hers, but I would love to have a very big closet. Do you like his and her master bathroom, or are you quite happy having a master no, bathroom no, no, together? No, it has to be big, but it could be the you, you know you're the happy sharing. The Maybe a little bit of difficulty there because my husband likes very modern, yes. and I um, tend to incline to more traditional style. I like to keep the details. Yes. So that symbiosis will be probably hard to deliver. Yeah. So we have a yin and yang scenario. It sounds like the perfect marriage. Okay. <laughs> I want to deliver your dream. I want you to. Have have the best house. So I want you to be like so happy. Nicola delivered exactly what I wanted. So I'll learn something from you. When you enter in the Chelsea house, the staircase is yes. the first thing you see. 100%. So it has to be striking. Yeah. It has to be imposing, but comfortable for us mm -hmm. and for the dogs to go up. Yeah. And the thing you mentioned about the dogs kind of worries me about how far do the dogs go up the house? Do they go into your bedroom area? Or are they, are they allowed only on kitchen level? Yes. They allowed everywhere. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's fine. It's a challenge. Yeah, it's we a, know. It is a challenge. I never said that will be easy. No, no, exactly. At the high end, the best way to choose your designer is to snoop around their previous work. So, Julia, what we did here, this is this lateral apartment. It's probably one of the best lateral apartments in London right now on the market. You would never get this unless you're in the league of like a 50 million pound house. So I know it's not your style. It's a kind of modern art deco going on. Modern, yeah, I mean, it, it was not really art deco, it's really more classical because the black and white floors um, are very classic of the period of a Georgian property. This two story apartment has been developed as a turnkey and is on sale for £20 million. Everything's bespoke. We've bespoke the kitchen, so we've mixed a lot of different finishes. We have polished walnut. This is um, a stone that we use in Miami, actually. So it's to give it a very different look, because every kitchen is so boring. This is all bronze inlay. This is wonderful. So all this design, this is all bronze. So the together. most of the stuff here is done bespoke? Everything's done bespoke. Mm -hmm. We don't have anything off the shelf. No, this is this is very impressive. This is very impressive. I like your attention to details. Okay, you're right. It's not my style. I know it's not your style because everyone's unique. It's just to give you an idea of the detailing. Nicola has furnished the apartment from top to toe, offering clients and their staff a complete home identity. First, they get a manual on how to clean everything. And then the housekeeper will have a manual photograph of every shelf. We photograph every shelf. Let me just explain. So here, we will photograph this. How it has to look like. How it has to look. And then, because most clients are buying a lifestyle, and they love it like this. And then the housekeeper will move this, they'll move this, and it will look Horrendous. So then we get called back to the house ten times arranging accessories. So now what I've learned over the years, if I give them a manual, this shelf looks like this. So then if they want to put it back, they can put it back. Or And generally, <laughs> I go back into people's homes five or six years later. They're identical. Everybody wants turnkey. They want to move in. These people are always very busy. But they want to move in with their own stuff. They move in with their suitcases. At a much earlier stage of development, this five-storey Mayfair townhouse will go on sale later this year. <laughs> Are you OK? No, yeah, because I'm going to be all dusty. Yeah, but it's fine. I'm like it all the time. I have the dirtiest fur coat in London. Anyway, so in here, um, this is going to be the pool. 
Is it necessary? Pretty standard out of like every 10 houses, eight of them that we're working on, we'll have a pool, spa mm -hmm. area, mm -hmm. um, massage, it is, it is usual. So yeah. basically you don't need to go out ever? No, ever. How well, much do you think project of this scale? Cost. The market? Yes. It would have cost about 10 million to do. 10 million to do. Spend. Okay, and it and will it be probably around gone, uh, 30, 30 four, million? No, more? way more. Way, way more, oh, way more, way more. So the, basically this particular house can fully furnish. You know, people will bring their own Picassos and their own Monet or Damien Hirst or whatever they're <laughs> buying or collecting. Here, you know, um, we were in the study and you went, oh, the study's very masculine. It's very much Mayfair. What if the woman in the family is a working girl? Will you do it all in pink? <laughs> we don't actually do work with many girly what? houses at all. Oh, okay. <laughs> For Julia, this is not the creative partnership that she'd imagined. Will two opinionated women work well together? I'm not sure about that. And um, my husband is very involved in a project, but uh, I'm not sure he needs to be um, intimidated all the time. <laughs> Designing one's dream home is no easy task, regardless of the budget. Everyone has their own unique tastes and styles. But when you're designing a house with no idea who will live in it, it's even more difficult. We're creating a home for the unknown, mm -hmm. unknown person, which is, you know, a difficult thing at the best of times. So Sally McCarrath is still choosing the interior for her luxury artist studio. Most chandeliers are going to be drowned mm. by that room. Yeah. It's just too huge. We had the idea of clowns. Yeah. We could play safe and do just generic, I don't know, white ceilings and French grey walls. And, but we're not going to do that because this house was never that. This was this extraordinary place with extraordinary creative people who crossed the threshold. Um, actually, the challenge is how we communicate old Chelsea and all the magic and all the stories that have happened here without making it like some old fusty old museum, but we've actually got to repurpose it for the 21st century. Sally is trying to create a millionaire's vision of Chelsea that celebrates its bohemian heyday. And to advise her, she's called upon a Chelsea resident steeped in local history. This is my, my collection of Chelsea books. This is a, a very important pair of books, which is the first history of Chelsea written in 1829 by somebody called Thomas Faulkner. Without showing off at all, I suppose I am, I am considered an authority on Chelsea. Some people call me Mr Chelsea, but I think that's a bit extreme. David Lillet has lived in Chelsea for 50 years. The very name Chelsea conjures up the idea of something artistic, vaguely bohemian, slightly risque, um, and that's what Chelsea lives off. Of course, today, it's neither artistic nor bohemian. It's where the rich of the world live. Nothing, nothing in Chelsea comes cheap. It might be very nice and very agreeable, but cheap it ain't. <laughs> we don't have Greggs in the King's Road. <laughs> Have you ever heard of Greg's? <laughs> Sally has called on David to advise her on the studio's historic details. And this is going to be a, a, a stir in steel and timber mm -hmm. and brass and leather. It's going to have leather treads. Um, oh, really? Yeah. We're doing silver walls. Frederick the Great <laughs> liked silver gilt. Did you know that? Oh, good. I mean, good. As opposed then. to gold gilt. <laughs> um, so, what we're doing here is a new part. Very much a 21st century bit of the building. I hope it doesn't leak. It's, it's, you hope. We <laughs> <laughs> held to pay if it yeah. does. In particular, Sally has a plan to restore the painting studio to its original bright yellow. Is there some truth in this rumour about the studio being yellow? Augustus Charles Howell described standing in this room mm. like standing in the yolk of an egg. 
I mean, that's an extraordinary Quite. depth to the colour. And here's, the, here's this My painting. Goodness. Oh, this wow. is, and so this is, that, is, is that a portrait that that's been this in room, this room? In this room. Uh, Was it called the Yellow Room, the piece? That's right. <laughs> are you planning to paint it yellow? Well, that's, we're, that's the we're great actually, question. Well, what we are planning to do is put yellow fabric all mm -hmm. over the walls. Mm -hmm. Today paint is... would be much cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> Sally's ambition is somewhat at odds with David's more conservative tastes. One thing that I do wonder is why this is being done when Sally's uh, client is a property speculator who's going to sell the property. Taste is very much in the eye of the beholder. I just think that in this case, an enormous amount of money is being spent just for the sake of spending money. In central London, where developers and interior designers are awash with work, one lady is bucking the trend. In her recently purchased six million pound townhouse, Russian expat Julia has decided to go it alone in remodeling her home. I don't even understand the idea coming and just buying already a made up house. I don't want anybody just to chuck everything inside and say, this is your new home. No, that won't be home. At least it won't be mine. <laughs> You're not invited. Her latest avenue of inspiration is her next door neighbor. Is it okay if we will speak English? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, this is Taya Johnson lives in an identical sized house to Julia, but has spent two years building an extra basement and double height living room. Such a big windows, how hard is to open it? It's very easy. Everything is controlled from the iPad, so heating, electricity, everything. So, And we have English weather to come in. <laughs> <laughs> She's gutted the Chelsea interior and filled it with specially commissioned artwork from Georgia. These are all our children with their partners. We have uh, ten children, uh, children in total, so but seven living in the house. Three older ones you are... Have a ten, you have ten children? Yes, ten children in total okay. between us. <laughs> you look incredible. So that's the basement. Here is the loop. So I wanted to see the fish tank from the toilet. The builders were horrified. Said, oh, you can see everything. So we had to add more slates. But it's actually, I wanted to see more. There is a dining room on the other side. So you don't want it to be, <laughs> the, you know, from dining room to see what's going on in it. <laughs> this is petrified moss that's been injected with silicon. This is incredible because I thought it's a tile. No, no, it's a real, real moss. Sometimes it produces the smell of real moss, and I think it's really, yes, so it's very, very interesting. I like, like, you use your own ideas, you, you know what you like, and you go for that. Yes. And look at this, the effect is striking. For Julia, Taya's model is an inspiring one. I'm not sure if I want to use interior designer, honestly. Because I'm not professional, I can do whatever I want. I'm not constricted by the rules. I can go outside of the box. Maybe it won't be that bad. <laughs> oh, I hope it won't be that bad. For those that can afford to, Chelsea's artists' studios and houses offer the chance to create extraordinary homes. Few other neighborhoods offer such unique spaces. But for the few artists still remaining, Chelsea is perhaps becoming a more difficult place to live. Uh, Manhattan from New Jersey, 18 by 24, signed, varnished, stretched and framed. <laughs> Serena's husband spent 45 years painting from this studio, close to the Thames. I moved in with uh, when we got married in, in, in 1971, and we were paying 15 pounds a week. But now a developer has bought the freehold of the building and she can't afford to contribute to its renovation. They did give me figures. Large figures. <laughs> it was actually quite out of the question financially. So I um, decided I had to sell. For the old guard in Chelsea, the ways of the international super-rich are all a bit bemusing. 
they're digging under the garden. They're going to put it back on top, I gather. Basement, I think, is going to be a, a sort of um, media rooms. I don't know, just sort of underground living, exercising, I expect. Gyms, isn't that what people want nowadays? After almost 50 years, Serena is leaving Chelsea for a smaller flat across the river. Do you want to take the chairs down? Yeah. I hope everything's going to fit. That's my big worry. Uh, this is the picture I wanted to show you. This is Cecilia. This is Eugenie. And that's me there. It was a wonderful place to bring up the children, really. Definitely miss it. And there'll be big changes, so it'll be a very different place from what what I know. With four months to go until her artist studio completes, Sally is in Paris with her assistant Hannah on a continental shopping trip. I quite like it. It's got the leather. What are you thinking for the, for the studio? For the main space. Could that work in one of the bedrooms? It makes you smile. Uh, yeah. Oh, Hannah, look at this. The suede inside is so 1970. I love coming here. It's really inspiring. It's a mixture of seriously old pieces and gallery settings. It's very, very expensive. And then you see some terrible things. And I quite like the mad cacophony of it all. You know, it's part of the fun is unearthing things. Wow, look at those acrylic chairs. Fantastic 70s acrylic chairs. Sally is trying to attract a buyer with aspirations to be part of old bohemian Chelsea. Avoid... Aren't they cute? Would it fit there? No. I'm no. sure. Yeah, that's neat. When you walk into a home that is incredibly stylish, you probably make certain assumptions mm. about what that person does and the people that come and sit around their dining table. And really what we're trying to do is appeal to that. Uh, and that is a difficult thing to do. Sally's plan is to create an eclectic interior where every piece of furniture tells a story. This will create the illusion of a lifetime of adventure and artistry for any possible owner. Just like a stylist might dress a Hollywood celebrity for the Oscars, they don't choose what dress to wear, nor what jewellery to put with it. It is done for them. And I guess, at some level, we are tastemakers. She will travel thousands of miles, spending hundreds of thousands of pounds. And in Croatia, she will even explore a hidden world of buried timber. There is slabs of tree that we're going to be looking at. It's been buried in the mud for 8,000 years, which is an incredible thing. Sally is planning a dining room table made from bog oak fallen oak trees that have been submerged in a riverbed for millennia. Normally only found in sizes suitable for chess pieces or pipes, Sally's found one of the few places on Earth where there are planks big enough for a table. A diver is sent down into the river to look for this wood, and if they're lucky enough to find some, sling a rope around it and pull it up, and then they spend years drying it. It's very, very precious. The blacker the timber, the older it is. This wood is just stunning. It really is special. That's going to give us yes. the colour. The idea that there's a timeline from one end of the table to the other, so that you start with 8,000-year-old oak and you almost move towards the and end the of the table trees. to slightly younger wood, still 6,000 years old. When you pass the salt down the table, it's 2,000 years, it actually travels down to the end of the table. Oh, it's pretty good, actually. At this level of the market, there's an understanding that it's not about the money you spend, it's the story, the fact it's entirely bespoke. It's not a disposable, vulgar, wealthy, dripping in gold and shiny marble. That's not what this is about. Um, it's a one-off. Sally's desire for a one-off has led to ambitious design decisions, including covering an entire room in bright yellow satin. Her next stop is Milan, where she's persuaded an Italian company to produce the material especially for her. Cook 
cookies. It's like cookies, yes. yes. There's a lot riding on this moment, I suppose, but I'm, I'm excited to see what's going to come out. Looking a little orange. Yes. So here's where we're headed. Okay, I can't bear it. Let's have a look. Yeah. Okay, I'm just going to do yeah. this. Okay. I mean, it's a lot darker than what I'm holding in my hand. By the time 120 metres come off the roll, better have been a good decision. You're telling me that it's going to come out exactly like that. <laughs> Nervous laugh. Sally, don't worry, don't worry at all. Despite all this effort, Sally knows that if she gets it wrong, any new buyer might simply rip out all her hard work. It's not even that we have a client who said, that's absolutely what I want. We're second guessing um, the reaction people might have. They may dislike a piece of art, they may not like the colour of some of the rooms, who, who knows? It's speculative and that's the nature of it. Following her inspirational snoop around her neighbour's house, Julia is out shopping. I already start looking for some ideas. Uh, I've been in quite a few shops in terms of the textiles, in terms of the furniture. Today I will probably will be more interested in a technological side. Hello. Hello. Hi. 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 I'm Julia. Julia's house must suit her, her husband, and two very large dogs. Can I take your coat for you? Oh, that will be lovely, thank you. I like when fridge is big, because as I said, I store a lot of, I have a dog, and my dogs eat raw food, so I need a lot of storage for the freezer. If you look at these apples, that's been in there. Since October, six months? Yes. Oh my, okay, this is, in, this is very impressive. <laughs> it's something that was designed by NASA. Oh, interesting, you're catering for NASA. Yes. <laughs> is this a refrigerator this, as well? Yeah, this is a fridge freezer. I've known ladies that put one in the bedroom, so they keep their face creams and stuff in, but that's pretty uh, out there. <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> I love the idea. Julia's vision is for a very 21st century version of Chelsea life. Outside my house will look the same, but on the inside, I would like to change as much as possible. A house has to be modern, has to be comfortable. Hi, I'm Julia. I was just passing. So in the magazines, people are using a lot of leather as a decoration, not only on the walls, but also on the floor. So that basically, if I'm right now torn between the wooden floor, you know, staircase, which is quite slippery for <laughs> my four-legged family, so leather is a good idea. Yes, I think so. Too. And, and for the clothes? Mm -hmm. Yes, no problem. Oh, please yes. don't tell me it's a whole yes. bathroom in leather. So how often clients asking for the leather loo? For the toilet itself, it is probably a bit extreme, but for the bathtubs, it's just the super high-end high luxury end. market. For some truly space-age ideas, Julia is heading to a small shop just off Oxford Street. I don't think your buzzer is working. It is working, but uh, it's fingerprint recognition. Come in, please. <laughs> Philip Hine runs Cornflake, which showcases the latest in smart home technology. So here we are. We have a mirror TV here, and at the moment we have the CCTV. Your okay. outside camera just changed the angle. Correct. Because what we have here is a tracking camera. If it sees the same face in, say, half an hour, more than three times, it can send you an alert. You're to joking. say, there might be someone M looking more interested to break than in. More than necessary. Correct. Correct. Huh. Yeah. Right, so now we'll go into the drawing room. I have two Sharpies. Yes. So what kind of, you know, technology and will, be, will they be affected? So we could program the computer to feed the dog. You can uh, give the dog water. You can even get devices now that will throw the ball. How lazy you have, you have to get... Oh, no. Okay. You, can also, you can also get devices um, that uh, you attach to the collar that will give you the, the uh, heart rate. If the dog is lonely, they have like a little camera and I can talk to them? Yes, I've you seen that as well. Yes, I've seen that as well. <laughs> So we'll go through here to the um, bar and games room area. OK. Oh, lovely. We can control anything from anywhere in the world. People spend a great deal of money. I mean, 
refurbs for, for us uh, uh, when we're working with a client. They may spend £10 million on a refurb. They might spend £20 million on a refurb. £20 million refurbishing? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, yes, yeah, so this is our, uh, our cinema. We have a system. Uh... Over the coming months, Julia will visit hundreds of shops and snoop around many more neighbours' houses. While she is only a small player in the London property market, she'll use hundreds of craftsmen and artisans to help her realise her uniquely modern Chelsea dream. The international buyers bring in the different ideas here, especially the one who wants to improve the property they bought. So they hire in, you know, the upscale international designers who wants to bring something new, something innovative, something more interesting. It's brilliant because London is moving forward. It's advancing in technologies, in craftsmanship, and that's a big plus for London because I don't think English people want to invest that much in interior design, and I think it's sad. Over in Sally's studio development, her precious yellow fabric has arrived. Oh, it's not a bad colour. I mean, I think it'd be a bit much, but it's not a bad colour. Woohoo! <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, my goodness. It's extraordinary, isn't it? It doesn't even look like fabric. Absolutely amazing. It's subtle and intriguing, I suppose. That's, that's exactly what I wanted it to be. Good job, guys. How do you get it so tight? It'll take another month for the rest of Sally's furniture to arrive and for her ambitious, if risky, project to complete. <laughs> sure, it's much safer to do what everybody else does. Um, but, you know, if you just sort of take every project and do it in a generic way, uh, then, you know, why bother? I'm, I'm not interested in projects like that. Um, we need something that actually sets it apart from everything else. It's not long before all the noise has attracted Mr Chelsea himself. What do you think? Well, it's, it's, I think it's good, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the, it's the sort of yellow that Whistler would have liked. Oh, thank God! <laughs> well, I believe, anyway. You can see. But the fabric walls aren't the only thing David has to stomach. There's only one in the whole world, mm. and uh, it's made from... Plastic cable ties. Plastic cable ties. Don't you just love it? <laughs> <laughs> David's even arrived on the same day that the bog oak table is delivered. It's been carbon dated between seven and eight thousand years seven, old. It comes with a certificate. Eight thousand years 8, old. Eight thousand years old. It's pretty humbling, mm. actually. Mm. Whoa. It's good. The, bra the brass was the bit I was really worried about. So what we've done is you've, we've poured brass filled. in where it's naturally split. You can see yes. it here, actually. This is very, very nice. I like this brass infill. That makes it into a work of art, doesn't it? A stroke of genius, really, <laughs> filling it with, with brass like that. Looks great. For David, it's perhaps all a little overwhelming. Something which I've never encountered before is um, dressing up, one might say, um, a, a flat or a house for, for sale um, in such an extravagant and expensive way. I, I suppose I, I, I find myself not very in tune with the modern, you know, the modern idea of interior design, which is um, sort of, you know, very, very sort of quirky. For Sally, this is another chapter in the rejuvenation of London's historical streets and the natural evolution of Chelsea's neighborhood. Let's not pretend that this is a new phenomenon, that this is foreigners moving in and, and taking over our city and we, we have no benefits. Refurbishing old buildings is a very expensive business. Time and time again, people trot out this, you know, foreign money, it's bad, we don't want it. It's too easy to say that. 
there's an aspect of this that I feel very proud to be part of. You know, we are actually breathing new life into old buildings. As long as London's property remains the safest place for international investment, developers and international clients will continue to transform these exclusive streets. For some, this will spell the end of a community. So this is going. Yeah. This, there's, there's, that's going. I've emptied them because I thought it would be better. And I've emptied the desk oh, too. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Hiding under the sofa for many years. The building was purpose built for artists and artists to be able to live and work. It is sad to see the purpose of the building go. But that's happened all over Chelsea, I think, I fear because it's become so expensive. Whilst for others, it will simply mark the beginning of a new community. <laughs> oh, look at this. I love this street. And this is former art studios. Original family, I think, still live there. Or maybe lived until the recent times. <laughs>